but but but, but for real. <laughs> yeah. All right. Wait, someone just left. What happened? Rizak we lost Rizak. Oh. oh no. Oh good. good he guy. got cold feet. <laughs> <laughs>What's up, everybody? Welcome to Blood Sweet. Blood's the wow. It's been a little while, huh? And that's why Stefan's taking over. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. Maybe, maybe we'll cut that. Maybe we won't. We'll figure out a way to edit it in. But hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Mike Whitmire. Mike Whitmire, co-founder, CEO of Flowcast, inactive CPA. Welcome to our most recent upsa- up episode of Blood, Sweat, and Balance Sheets. I am stumbling through this introduction, which is why I think we're handing this job off to our new evangelist, Stefan Van Dyvendyke. And on that note, I'm sick of talking, so I'm going to hand it over, man. You take over. I'm being demoted. You're up. Thanks, Mike. I like how you were able to say my last name correctly without stumbling, <laughs> but stumbled over your own last name. I've been practicing. <laughs> I've been practicing. I appreciate it. It means a lot. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us on this episode of Blood, Sweat, and Balance Sheets. We're really excited to actually have our guest, Razak, um, with us. He, Razak Jarlow is our CFO here at Flowcast. A really dynamic guy. We're really excited to share his story today. And more importantly, just like get his thoughts on the industry and where things are going. So uh, I kind of called this episode when we were scripting it, the rise of the operational CFO, because I think Razak has to do so much here at Flowcast. And it's it's a really neat story. Um, Mike, I would let you speak, but you're stumbling through things. So I'm just going to go ahead and Razak, how about you give us a quick intro? How about you give us a quick background? Awesome. Well, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I've been at Flowcast for what eight eight months plus months now, but my career has spanned many different tech finance functions. Whether that was in the really old school EDA space at Synopsys, um, or whether it was going to Adobe working in corporate finance and then BU marketing finance, where we we really set the stage on how a company could transition from a perpetual box software to a better solution for customers in a subscription model. Um, time at, at Apple in terms of helping them sell as many pieces of hardware as they can, whether it's iPads, Macs, iPhones in North and South America. Um, some fun time at, at FinTech at Lending Club. And uh, most recently before Flowcast at Looker, where we were in BI and we exited to, to Google. Um, but that all that journey and understanding those different different components, whether it was product finance or marketing finance or corporate finance, um, really helped uh, prepare me for for what we're doing today at Flowcast. And you know, I think that's a little bit of the path of the the operational CFO, how they're having to understand many many different parts of the business going forward. Right. I really like how you're talking about. It. It's like you know, you can't. Um, I think the traditional path, and I'd actually like to your, get your thoughts on this. Your your traditional CFOs um, from like the '90s might have been like an accountant, and then it kind of switched to investment bankers and so on and so forth. But they they really had a very uh, close focus on maybe more of what investors wanted to see, and not always the success of the underlying um, economic engine of the company, right? The operations of the company. So you know, I think you, you and I have talked about this, and I'm sure you and Mike have talked about this extensively, but I would love to kind of get your thoughts on what you've seen change in the office of the CFOs kind of since the start of your career in the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you if you go back to the 90s, maybe even the early 2000s, you know, you look at CFOs and most of them were, were very internally focused on the accounting team and externally with the board and investors. And so you had a lot of backgrounds that were just pure controllership. You start a you know big four audit, you work your way into corporate, and eventually become CFO. And then you know in the '90s and 2000s, we started seeing things change. And it's because businesses changed, right? It was no longer just about your revenue and expense and margin last quarter. There were these new business models that were really focused on customer lifetime value, and you had to have a much more forward-looking understanding of the business and the customer to communicate that. And so you started seeing that that need for CFOs to communicate with investors and other things in those terms. And so you start seeing a little bit of shift backgrounds might have been more banking or VC, et cetera, to be able to articulate that. And then as you get further along, okay, it's 2010s and now the 2020s. And yeah, everybody knows LTV and CAC. Like that's not some some foreign new concept in the tech world. And so the, the new challenge, instead of now communicating lifetime value of customer, the new challenge is, well, how do I actually go about maximizing that? How do I actually make that come to fruition? How do I know that these 
these values that can be huge five, 10 years out, how do I know how to invest today? And how do I know how to work cross-functionally today for that to happen? And so you're seeing today's CFOs really have a much more operational lean or background, and you're seeing them drive a lot more value that way. And so the way you see that is 20 years ago, if you look at the S&P 500, 50% of them, almost 50% had COOs in place. And if you look at the S&P 500 in 2020, it was down to the high 30%, a little over a third. And so you're seeing less COOs. At the same time, they all still have a CFO. And those CFOs direct reports have gone up from four to six as they're absorbing operational responsibilities. And I think no team does that fall uh, more on than the accountants. If you look at finance leaders, they're predominantly controller or accounting backgrounds. And so those mm -hmm. people are constantly getting pulled and asked to do more and more operational work on a daily basis as finance works more cross-functionally across the entire company. Yeah, and and looking at your background, you have really strong on that finance side, right? So it seems like a lot of your experience has been that way. Um, has that been a purposeful kind of like path for you? Yeah, I think there was definitely a lot of purpose in my path, whether it was first getting corporate finance experience or getting more business model finance experience or getting product strategy finance experience. Um, in addition to some, some core accounting comp competencies, that ability <clears throat> to connect the dots. So a lot of times we call it some places on the finance side, call it from, from quote to cash, but really the entire customer lifetime value is really helpful in being able to articulate two business partners and two investors and to your CEO on why we should make this investment over all others. Cause we see the full picture. We're not just looking at, at one number in a silo. If I could just chime in real quickly. <laughs> I'll, I'll let just this one, you get one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I remember, I remember interviewing, you know, Razak obviously. And when we were looking for the CFO, we've, we've seen the operations role playing out through the use of our product. And, and we know this is where it's going. So finding somebody who had that kind of breadth of experience to be operational and take a lot of work off my plate was a big focus when we we're doing the interview process. And like, Razak, what struck me so much about you is it seems like you were so intentional throughout your career. And quite frankly, I think you undersold yourself a little bit as you're going through it. You know, it's like Adobe, you helped lead one of the biggest transformations from on-prem software to cloud-based software. And that's a complete change in revenue model, engineering effort, R&D, like everything. And that's, it was a massive company at the time. And they had the guts to make that call to make that transition. And I'm I'm sure it wasn't easy at that scale. And then you went to Apple and got that, you know, your your conversations about Lending Club and working with the R&D team on that side. I was like, whoa, he's getting way outside of finance. And then you went to you went to Looker and you were basically staring down the barrel of an IPO like the next day. And then Google took you guys out. And so I'm just like, I'm talking to you and it was so intentional, your experience. It was so broad. And I could tell you were you know, from day one, I feel like you've wanted to be a CFO who takes a company public. I could tell you were lighting everything up for that. And I'm like, all right, you're going to come do it at Flowcast. So I'm, I'm really excited you're here. There it for is. Starters, it's been awesome working with you. You've taken a ton of work off my plate, made my life way better, way easier. And like not just taken work off my plate, but helped accelerate the business and do things that like we haven't done in the past. And I think back to one of the key conversations we had was when you were talking about the number of product lines that you need to become a 10 or $100 billion company and just how forward thinking you were on all that. I'm like, holy crap. If I If I think back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I started my career in audit, there's no way the CFO was having these types of conversations with the CEO. It was like the CFO was literally, here are the financials, I, I approve them. CEO, here are the financials, like, let me know what you need for the board deck. And the CEO would do all of it. Now it's completely different. And yeah, I feel like it's embodied in your work at Flowcast. It's been, yeah, anyway, enough praise. It's been great working with you, man. Thank, like, exa thank you, exactly Mike. where I think the role's going. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I'll, I'll say it's a, it's a very fun time to be a CFO, especially a CFO of a company with a, a great culture and product. So there's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic time for, for CFOs everywhere. There's a lot more interesting problems than there were 20 years ago. Uh, I actually, with all of Mike's praise, I would actually like to ask a little bit of a personal question. How is it being the CFO not just for you, but your whole department of a company of accountants, right? Like I think 70% of our workers are either uh, currently accountants or previously were accountants. Like that's gotta be, that's gotta be a big weight on your back. 
It's uh, well, first, it's it's actually. I don't know if that's true. Really, yeah, it's, it's actually really <laughs> awesome because people understand the importance of a lot of what we do in finance, since I, a lot of people have accounting backgrounds here, and I think. Um, I will say it definitely keeps you on your toes and that, um, you know, there's, there's no, uh, there's no hand waving on, Oh, this is just a finance thing we need to do. Everybody can call you on your, on your bull. If you, if you try and do that, cause we, yeah. we do have you a strong accounting finance yeah. background. <laughs> yeah. But hopefully expense reports are getting in on time and budgets are updated a little sooner. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's no training yeah, was, anybody was, on SAS metrics. Like we're, we're into all that stuff as an organization. Yeah. For sure. yeah. 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 I love that. For me, since I've obviously never been a CFO, and it's always been kind of a role, you kind of just kind of you you look through almost like uh, some opaque glass, trying to figure out, okay, what are they doing in there? What's going on? Have you seen a change in like the deliverables and your audience that the CFO has over that period of time? You're kind of talking about earlier where you only really had to communicate uh, with the board and maybe with the CEO and a few other like executive business leaders. Has that changed or or is it really still the same? The conversation's just just different. Oh, I, I, I do believe it's dramatically changed. Uh, I think if you know it's hard for me to say exactly what it was 20 years ago, but my perception is the uh, the CFO was was primarily focused on on the close and controls and and external investors, whether that be the board or or investment groups. And now I would say probably 66% of the uh, the CFO's time is on is on other things, right? Whether that be operational imperatives that are cross functional, whether that be FP&A and forecasting and, and figuring out where we're going, um, and so now it's probably closer to that ratio for CFOs. Mm-hmm. I think it'll change per CFO. If you've got a really strong controller in your finance org, yep. you can spend more time operationally than if you don't. Um, mm-hmm. but it's, it's definitely the, the needs are there and you'll see for us, for example, we have our, our biz ops team, our entire biz ops team, not just the finance systems team reporting into the office, of the CFO, you'll see other companies with, with it or HR or, or other areas that report into the office, of the CFO, and it's different at every company, but I think the, the universal truth is it's more than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Right. And, it, you know, when I was kind of listening to your story on your like, you know, or what what Mike was telling me of your story was you had, you know, you were doing some corporate finance stuff, you moved into more corporate sales side and working with them on their financial figures and how to do it, transform, uh, transforming a company's kind of traditional economic model from hardware to being cloud based, you know, which all leads to being a very dynamic CFO, do you think that's necessary for the role? Like if you were looking at someone and you were given advice today, you know, they're walking into their career and they're like, damn it, I want to be Rizak in 20 years. Do you think they need to have all those different hats in order to be a CFO when it's their time? Or, you know, is there, do you think the path is even changing more from there? Uh, it's it's hard to talk in absolutes. So I don't know if need is the right word. I would definitely mm-hmm. say it helps the the more broad uh, experience you have. The ultimate thing that I think will separate the okay CFOs from the really good ones. So the okay ones are, they're not going to do anything that makes the company bank- bankrupt. They're going to make sure everything gets done. Uh, it's going to be okay. The The really good ones are going to be able to influence the rest of the teams and the rest of the executives. They'll be able to go in and talk to the CTO or the CRO or other C-level executives and partner with them on okay, here's what I'm seeing. And this is why I think it's important that we do this instead of that. And can you help me solve this problem? Or can I help you solve a problem I see in your organization? And so obviously the the more boxes you check, the better. You have more experience. You've proven you can do it across multiple functions. But that innate skill set that you have to be able to go in and talk to every single person, not just one area when you're influencing. Because the the best companies have a really strong C-level leadership team, and they are all experts in their own domain. So you generally, in today's world, get a lot more done, a lot more efficiently if you can partner and influence with the rest of your peers, as opposed to just using a, a hammer of, we said this was going to be the financial target. Here it is. I don't care how you get there. You just just figure it out yourself. That, that That's right. not the, the most efficient and successful path. Right. Kind of like you were saying, where you're not really, you know, like, or really, Mike, you were saying, you're no longer just taking financials being like, all right, here's your budget for the year. 
we'll report back on how you did, which will be poorly because we don't care. And now you're now you're really tied to the success that those teams have. So it's like, you know, okay, I've handed it to you. Now I'm going to actually help you achieve that goal, right? Yeah, you, you hear so much about it. this was the, I think, reputation historically is it's the office of no. You know, the, C- <laughs> the CFO is just always going to say no to whatever you want to spend. And it's the person who drops the hammer on whatever you, whatever, you know, crazy next thing you want to do or make sure you're compliant with everything. But that's, and that was true, but that's all that's all changing. Yeah, to Razak's point, it's about partnering with people and figuring out, you know, what's the, yeah, maybe we do take on some expense if it's a, what's a good investment for the company, or maybe we can think of controls a little bit differently here because it's holding us back too much on go-to-market or something like that. Just being more, yeah, more business-minded and thinking holistically about the organization. Yeah, I um, it, it's, it's really been interesting because I've audited a lot of the companies that, you know, back when I was at KPMG that you, you look at the way the CFO runs the office or the way that the tone of the company. And like you said, it's that office of no, but the successful companies like Flowcast, like other ones that they're coming in to be that partner. And, and that's um, also just like the fun place to work, right? Like that's, that's a place you enjoy because you can actually realize dreams and you're not just sitting there like, Oh man, I just have people like holding me down. Like I just got shackles on me and I'm never going to get my head above water. I, I remember a, re- a really good learning experience for me was at Cornerstone watching their CFO operate and what he did. I but I kind of internalized his mode of working as more he's a founder and an early stage guy and that's that's what you do. Mm-hmm. But he was very business focused, you know, was doing all the all the back office stuff, but was really like, you know, he one project he gave me was negotiating our lease of a new office in India. And I was like, that's you know, CFO's doing that stuff and handing it off. That's interesting. He was working with investors, but also like very focused on sales and was very pro sales. Wasn't I remember one night where we had a rep in Europe who closed the biggest deal in company history and his his commission as a result of that was going to be a million dollars for a quarter and you know our controller is freaking out about it we're not going to give him a million dollars blah blah whatever and Perry our CFO is like yes we are and i will give him 10 million dollars if he closes 10 times as much business like go for it do you know how much market cap he's adding to our organization and it's like that's the right mode of thinking of this giving this guy a million dollars has added 100 million in market cap to our business not a million's too much. How do we claw away from that? And you know, can we refer back to something? It's just like I saw that mentality with Perry at Cornerstone. Assumed it was a startup thing, but realized it's not. It's like now CFOs of kind of all stages think and operate that way, and it's it's a it's a cool transition for the role. Yeah, seeing that like truly understanding that bigger picture, right? Because yeah. I, when I look at companies, I think you know somewhat of what you were saying earlier, Zach, where what you know, the CFO has changed because the communication required has changed, right? What people want to know has changed. So it's it's more almost of a communication issue. And if it's not a communication issue, it's generally a perception issue. And so it's, um, you know, as we, as we, as we look at kind of like your career, Zach, it's, it's all about how do I communicate with that broader organization? And, and that has to do with, do I understand the big picture? Is my perception broad enough that I can communicate success with everybody, which is an incredible talent because there's just so many lenses to look at. I clearly gave up and was like, take me on Flowcast. I can't handle any more of these perceptions. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's um, it's just like just having that realization that there is a larger, even a larger story to tell, right? It's not about what's happening today. It's not about the results at the end of the month. It's not the results at the end of the quarter that necessarily matter. It's where we're going to be at in five years. So, you know, when you, when you look at that and how you have to have this broader story and this broader communication you're giving Razak, has that really changed? That, that just seems like a lot on your plate. How has that changed your role in, in, in your day-to-day work? Well, one, I'll start with why I kind of love the role and what I do is that uh, I, I'm kind of interested in everything. And so I love that my day-to-day job requires me to go out and partner with our CRO. I don't know sales better than our CRO. I, mean, I don't know sales better than most of the people in sales, um, but I have to. I get to work with them and I get to provide insights into that sales org. Same with marketing, same with R&Ds, and you go on down the list. And I think... Um, that does require more time and investment to actually get up and, and spend time. You can't just swoop in and talk to them once a quarter when it's you know your forecast or your or your planning cycle and expect to have that that value based in interaction. Um, and so I, I do think it's also become a a lot more about hiring 
people that are actually really, really willing to learn and operate great in what I call blank space or white space where there's not already an answer. There's not a mm -hmm. manual on how to turn that crank and get that process out. And so having a, a team of leaders that love to embrace kind of new challenges, maybe things they haven't seen before, but they can apply past experiences to something similar um, is, is really powerful. For me, that was, you know, that was going from, from Apple selling, selling iPads and iPhones to consumers and then going to FinTech and, and Lending Club. And like, that sounds like something completely different. How, what are the similarities? Like, well, look at Apple, it's got supply and demand. We're trying to get all the right phones and the right configurations in the right stores for customers that have that demand to buy them. At Lending Club, you're trying to find the right borrowers at the right time with the right credit profile and match them with the banks or hedge funds that, that want to make that type of loan. And so when you can take past experiences, even if they're not exactly the same and apply them to new ones, that definitely helps uh, whether you are you know, a controller or in biz ops or an FP&A working cross-function with business partners to, to leverage your experience to help them out. Yeah. And, uh, and like, yeah, I love that kind of the idea of that where I think, uh, I don't know, maybe it was the same for you guys when in college, you know, uh, a lot of people have this perception of accounting where they're like, oh, you know, you're just, you're a bean counter, you're just plugging away at numbers, whatever. And then you talk to you maybe some audit partners that are doing recruiting or some professors and they're like, oh no, you get to see new clients every day. It's dynamic. It's changing, whatever. And you kind of go through, I feel like I've kind of gone through um, peaks and valleys in my career where sometimes I feel like accounting is super dynamic and I feel like that today. And there's other times where I'm like, no, nah, man, like I'm just, I'm just here like punching a clock, trying to get work done, trying to survive. But it's, it's, I like hearing that at kind of almost maybe the, what's considered the end of the journey, the CFO, um, you still find it super dynamic, right? So the end all is you still have all that real broader engagement with the uh, organization, which is like really cool to hear. And I think hopefully if we have any really, um, you know, young listeners that are kind of early in their career or trying to figure out careers, this can maybe help them uh, figure out where they want to go with it. And that, for the people that are maybe, you know, at their valley right now, they're, they're seeing the peak uh, of, of, of what ha Jarlo has here, Razak has here. I, and I'll also say like accounting, I think has something for everyone because not, not everybody is like us and wants to become a CFO and next level and like work a ton of hours and make a ton of money. Like a lot of people want to nine to five or it's predictable. They make good money. They can mm -hmm. spend time with their family. They get good benefits. And like, if that's your personality, no knock on that. That's great. Like, go, you know, have a, have an amazing work-life balance and spend time with your family. And like, yeah, you might be doing some rote work in accounting, but it requires some intelligence. You apply your expertise and you have a comfortable role where you're not going to get terminated, right? Because job security yep. is really solid in accounting. And so it, there are different personalities out there. If you're super ambitious and want to become C-level, that's an opportunity. If you want a good paying, stable job so you can spend time with your family and set up for retirement, like that's also an option. It's a really, it's a really cool field. I think you can get whatever you want out of it as long as you like position yourself properly. And yeah, I, I would I add that. to that. I think that's don't, true. Don't be afraid to uh, to push for what your organization needs. We're seeing the office of the CFO really start to invest heavily in technology. And I mentioned earlier, like you got to have good people, you got to hire great people, you got that talent. If you actually want them to come, you actually want to retain them. You have to do everything you can to take the more boring parts of their job that can be automated to automate, so they can use their intelligence to to do the really important things. And so you're seeing. You're seeing that technology and investment, not just from a pure ROI standpoint of we save this many hours in finance or accounting because we have this integration. It's uh, it's even more than that. And that I can I can have the best people doing their best work if I'm not asking them to spend 90 percent of their time turning a crank on something. I invest in some technology. So now it's more 50 50 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's actually something that I've realized in my career. Like, you know, you you only need to automate like certain things, um, but but automating that kind of mundane, mundane stuff is really good. But at the same time, some of that is always going to be there, and some of that is always kind of necessary to give your mind rest when you're trying to do the super strategic stuff, right? So maybe maybe you get it to fifty fifty. Maybe it's 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 twenty five mundane, seventy five strategic. But there's always going to be an element there. But then it does allow people to like really engage in those strategic tasks and get out of that tactical. And what I enjoyed at, at Kodiak when when we were able to get people out of mundane tasks is like you really had someone that was the best 
at understanding what they were doing now freed up to think about how to make it even better. Right. So instead of me, the controller saying, well, you know, um, I think we'd better if we did this, that, and the other, it's like, well, how many invoices have you processed? And I'm like, none, 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 you know? And they're like, yeah. So get back to me once you've done one. So by maybe doing a couple of things I suggested, cause it wasn't always wrong. Um, but then I was, but then my, you know, leader in that department, my AR manager or my AP manager or my um, senior accounting manager would have more time to be like, you know, it'd be great if we did X, Y, and Z. And next thing you know, like they were able to move more in mundane or they were able to engage more with that broader organization and get to that ideal that we share here of um, really an operational accounting department and, you know, an operational office of the CFO, which is fantastic. There can be something very soothing about doing a reconciliation. I, I, I found myself last week reconciling two data sets, doing something on the customer side. Just been, it's very, it can be a great learning experience. I learned a lot about how yes. are using Flowcast in extreme detail. Um, and occasionally sometimes putting your head down and wailing away on keyboards for a little while is a good way to get some some stuff done. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it for scaling, but there's something cathartic yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, I do like it's pulling up Excel every once in a while. It's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's like twist. Yeah. yeah. Reconciling data sets. There's something twistedly fun about it. Yeah. What, um, you know, so, so, and, and Mike, I think you could probably share quite a bit about this as well, but it seems like that relationship with your team has, has changed quite a bit. And so instead of hiring people just to like, punch numbers or do something, you're really, like I said, you're trying to get the right person in, in the right role. And it sounds like, you know, kind of like rising tides raise all ship, right? So since the, since the CFO has all these extra demands on them, since they need to go broader into the organization, communicate more, that means there's more on the controller, more on, you know, the director of finance, VP of finance, there's more on your, your, your accounting managers. So has that changed the way or have, have you seen that change the way people are communicating with their team instead of just saying, hey, you know, did you get all your checklist items done today? Is it more of like, well, I'm assuming those are done because we, we've operationalized those. Now, let's get into the weeds of what we're doing to make life better here at the company. Um, well, the good news is I, I have all the confidence in the world in our accounting department, so I don't bother them to understand what's going on. My my whole thing about you know running Flowcast is I, I try to, and it's a fault of mine. I'm trying to work on it, but like I'm very I'm very good at focusing on what's not going well and trying to help fix those areas and sort of ignoring where things are are going well. And so that's sort of kind of what I do is hop around the organization depending on where I think the most kind of fixing needs to be done. I hear people love it, Mike. They yeah, really yeah, like yeah. No, it's like a that. really yeah. endearing <laughs> form of leadership and I'm trying to not do it, but it's sort of like, I don't know. I feel like it's, I feel like it's a founder thing. It's, it, it just sort of is yeah. a, a founder. It's, it's your baby and whatever's not working well, you want to help fix it. And, you know, there's no, in my opinion, there isn't much value to patting our back with the things that are going well. You know, that's not going to make the organization better. Just focusing on what's going well. It's you, you fix what's not going well. Let's say <laughs> get better, but yep. yeah. you are correct. That can be a very annoying trait of mine. But the good news is like, yeah, I trust, I trust accounting. I, we, I always get my books that I always get the numbers on time and feel no need to like dig in on that side of the house, given the, the team that we've hired. I'm, I'm kind of the same way as Mike. Michael, remember, we were just in a meeting the other day where I, where I had like 20 qu pointed questions at one presentation. And at the end, I was like, I should have led with this. But overall, this was amazing. We need to do this. This is great work <laughs> after after 20 minutes of me just diving on like the exceptions, like Mike was saying. At but, least you uh, said it at some point. I, I don't even <laughs> say it. I'm not good about it. <laughs> Um, but I would I would say it's not just the CFO getting pulled operation. I'd say it's the entire team, right? Whether it is FP&A having to, to create budgets that are built by drivers, whether it's biz ops having to make sure they have exec sponsors are signing up for goals from every biz ops system project, whether it's the controllership and and maybe working cross functionally to solve things like like quote to cash process and and really optimize for where the exceptions are really coming from much earlier in the funnel and pipeline. Um, all those things are, are constantly changing. And I think that um, it's not just the CFO getting pulled that way. I'd say it's the all of finance getting pulled that way. So um, you're, so like the way I understand it is like, you know, if, if something's going on with sales side, you know, um, it's not just you talking to, you know, your CRO, you're gonna be like, all right, let's get, you know, whoever's over um, commissions, whoever's over revenue on the accounting team, whoever's over that budgeting process on the finance team. And we're all going to sit down in a room and assign tasks and figure out how we can help you. Not just, well, I'm going to walk into the CFO. I'm going to solve all your problems and walk away. 
I mean, that's a great, like Razak, let's talk about, hey, we want to optimize sales at Flowcast. Like who's actually involved in that conversation? It's super interesting how much of it rolls up to you. Like if you want to just name names, it's it's like a really, <laughs> it's fascinating, right? Because it's yeah. Matt, it's Matthew Maloney. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I'll let you go. I'll let you go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we have a go-to-market finance team that is the FP&A team that solely works with, with you know, our CRO and CMO. And most of our time is not focused on the budgeting. Most of it's focused on on the funnel and sales productivity and, and maximizing uh, or reducing friction or creating the right incentives for, for go-to-market. Um, we've also got, obviously, our, our commissions team as well that, that touches all that. We've got all of our accounting team that touches all the sales orders. Um, and, and you start adding all that up and business systems, uh, you know, sales is probably the biggest biz group of business systems in the company. And so a lot of our biz ops team is focused primarily on go-to-market systems. And you add all those up and it touches almost everybody in the office of the CFO. And then if you if you include other things that aren't even customer related, but the expenses and purchasing and everything else that, that supports go to market, everybody touches that. And you can you make a similar case for R D in a lot of ways. And you make a, you know, so I think the uh, the amount of people that have touch points and the expectation of touch points. So you're using an example of CFO and CRO talk and work it out. Like the ideal situation is you know, the controller, our controller noticed something. He's like, hey, this is wrong. I'm going to go talk to my counterpart in sales ops. We work together. We fix it. By the way, CRO, CFO, this came up. We're working together closely already. You don't have to do anything. It's it's working just fine or it will be working yep. fine in a month uh, is, is really the ideal situation. So a lot of things don't even make it up when you're working cross-functionally like that. Yeah. And I, I, lo I love that because it really, it just goes back to it's like, listen, it's not just the CFO. It's the whole team. And it's a really dynamic um, part of the business, right? Like, I think a lot of people don't have insight into it. Here at Flowcast, it's obviously very top of mind for us. It's in our culture to be very mindful of it. But a lot of companies don't really understand what accounting can or should or would do for them. And this is what it should be, right? It is truly an advisor and a partner and, and not just, oh, well, it's someone I got to ask or like report to or whatever. It's like, no, you, you should be able to lean on this team and they want to help you and want you to lean on them. And I'll throw in one of the things is a lot of responsibility has been added to accounting. And with that, it does require more headcount. You can't replace everything with tech. You do need to hire extra help to do all those supporting functions. And so just like furthering the job steadiness within the you know accounting world and having that job security around that is just there will be more needs in the accounting team as a result of this responsibility being taken on yeah and you know the what's interesting to me and, and i just love kind of your take um Razak, is how do you get the right person in the right place you know because a lot of it like you said is that white space where where there isn't a solution or there isn't maybe uh, institutional knowledge or background on how to go about solving this. So, so how do you look at your team and say, okay, this is the person I need to have here and assist with this task, or they're the person that can be a project leader in this case? Are you looking at, you know, kind of like what I look at when I hear about your career, you're like you have very tangible experience on a lot of different aspects of finance and accounting, but you can't always hire a team like that. So how do you push them into those places? Yeah, I think I think everyone's got a uh, a slightly different rubric on how they do that. For for myself, I like to uh, I, I kind of use the fifty fifty rubric. Like, does per can the person do fifty percent of it already, and then they can figure out the other fifty percent. Um, and the way the way I judge if someone can do that is one: do, do they have the right mindset? There are some roles that are mm -hmm. very black and white, and you're your interactions are primarily finance based on the rule set and you can come to agreement talking to like-minded individuals. And then there's other areas that are like a lot of understanding the, the gray areas of everything in terms of, well, yeah, Mike's example, like, yeah, this is sure. This is a huge commission expense and that's a lot of money for one person. But if I look at the long term, like this is the right thing to do and I'm happy to do this. Um, so, so that second mindset and second is that mindset. And then third, I would um, really say, do they have the right, the right network to actually get it done? Do, am I sending them in to go talk to a head of sales ops that they've never met before? Or do they already have a relationship with that head of sales ops and I know they can get it done? Have they, if, they, if we're doing something we've never done before, 
Do they have a professional network outside of the company where they can call and leverage their network to find out what, what how to get started, the best solutions? How do they how do they get this project done in a month rather than spending five months spinning and then finally figuring it out mm -hmm. six months in? So those things are are always helpful. And I think especially for people who have who have a career, not just uh, different companies, but in different roles, they'll have that network that they can always call people up and, and figure stuff out. And also yeah. work, working with sales coming from finance, like respect is earned for sure. Cause that's kind of a new, and you know, the stereotype between sales versus accounting is like definitely there. So when we, when we made some, some of those hires under you, you know, it was a little skeptical from the revenue side, but then when they started working with, with those guys, they were like, holy shit, they are so good. Like, and, and they were legitimately making our, our CRO and sale, like they were just making them better and taking work off their plate and giving them insights they had never had before. So like, yeah, if you're going to step into that role, I, I will say just respect is earned. You got to deliver and help them out. And they will love you so much if you deliver really well. That's the dynamic we have, we have here. You know, really is true. That's like, you know, I, I love that you touched on like your internal network at the company. Do they have they built that trust with people that you, they can lean on it to get projects done? Uh, you know, sometimes that's yes, sometimes that no. And then also making sure that people have external networks. Is that something I've always leaned on a lot too in my career is reaching out to people that I know and being like, hey, you guys did this two years ago. I don't, why would I try to recreate the wheel? Tell me what you learned, you know, to share your story with me. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I was going to do it that way. Glad I didn't. You know, like I, I found out apparently, yeah, you nearly, you know, quit your job because of how miserable that experience was. So I, I really like that. What I'd be interested in hearing, Mike, is do you have that same 50-50 rubric? I have a feeling as like a founder and an entrepreneur spirit, you're like, no, you guys can just do it. I believe in you. Wait. Uh, you don't want to admit it? <laughs> I don't know. It always depends. It always depends. I'm going to pass on answering this I mean, you throw throwing accountants at a lot of like non-accounting issues at the company and it's worked really well. well so I've, like... I really like one of my things is in, in software as a service, there are so many jobs that there are not majors for. And as such, everything True. is learned on the job, like, like sales. There's no major for sales. That's learned on the job. Customer support. There's no major for that. It's all learned on the job. And so take that as fact. Number one, number two, accounting, difficult career, difficult to major in passing the CPA exam is really difficult. Working in audit is a grind. It's really hard. You learn to put up with a bunch of bullshit so, and you become professional. So as a result of that, like if, if someone's made it through two or three years in audit, I can very fairly assume they're smart, hardworking, and can pick things up quickly. Now, if we move them into a role where they need to learn something on the job, like sales or customer success, as long as we pair them with a manager who's competent within that domain, they can train them up just the way they could train up any other human being. And we just happen to have a group of people that we can pull from who are incredibly smart and qualified and hardworking. And it's a great advantage for us. And so, yeah, why not, why not save some people from accounting, teach them to do something different and still apply that knowledge that they have to like not feel like they're disappointing their parents because they left accounting, <laughs> you know, that's the reality of it. I, uh, that is, it really is. And I, I just love the point that you made that there really, there really isn't a, ma a major for sales or uh, business development or a, like customer success. Some, sometimes those aspects are talked about in your education, but they're not. There's not really a program for it. So, so why are you trying to put someone in there that doesn't that will never have that background? It's more about the training and the structure you bring to them instead of their background necessarily. Yeah, I think that's- a, Which like, by the way, it's, in, it's insane. Sales and CS are two of the biggest departments at Flowcast and there's no major <laughs> for that. You gotta be kidding me. Like what a joke. Somebody needs to get that going. <laughs> It's not us. We have too much shit to do, but somebody needs to get, <laughs> yeah. get that going. I was, I was afraid you were about to just I'm, take I'm glad Mike project. said that. No, no. <laughs> we got enough stuff to deal with. Yeah. Razak just had like, you know, just like one vein pop right here. It was like, please don't commit to one more thing, Mike. <laughs> uh, we, got oh. accounting, we got an accounting industry to save. That's what we're focused on. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's very true. Um, no, I really, I really like where that conversation went. That was good. So, so this is kind of a, a question for both of you, and uh, I, I want to start with you, Razak. Is is where do you really see the future of the office of the CFO? So, so not just the office, but you know, the CFO uh, period. You know, the the broader team and organ this place in the organization. Where where do you see it in just like the next five years? You know, like two to five years. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's on a good trajectory. Where I see it, it 
changing. I wouldn't say I see it changing significantly. Where I see it changing is becoming even more operational and driving even more cross company major transformation projects. Um, you know, we have we have all of our business systems in the office of the CFO to help do that at Flowcast. We think that's really important that that all of our systems work together and we're prioritizing the systems for the overall company needs rather than a bunch of silos where each team just has a budget, it's given each year it grows 20 or 30%, um, and they just prioritize within their own silo. And I think that's one example, but I think you're going to see that uh, a lot more over the coming years, in even going all the way to the top of the funnel. And how do we make sure we target the right customers that have the right financial profile five years down the line? And I think you're going to see CFOs continue to drive that. We are going to continue to to move up the uh, priority list on uh, workflow and automation software for finance people. This is something uh, other teams have invested in heavily over the last 10, 15 years. They've figured it out. And just in the last two or three, people are figuring out, hey, actually, accounting needs this too. Um, And so we're starting, I think Mike figured it out before everybody else, but we're starting to see the rest of the industry figure it out. And I think that's going to continue. And you're going to really see the these platforms within the office of the CFO take off. And, and you kind of see those as like, um, you know, like that's the starting point to where it kind of bleeds into the rest of the organization. Or you see that as like, well, it's just really a tool within a, with accounting finance. Oh, definitely bleeding, definitely driving across the organization because there's really... I think of it in, in there's three types of systems, right? There's there's your what system, which is the one we're all familiar with. You know, it's your ERP or your Salesforce. You look mm-hmm. it up, it tells you what the number is, and that's the number. And then you know, the other thing is kind of the the, the why systems. Like think of your your BI systems and things like that. In terms of well, let me look at these numbers over time and compare them against each other, and I can figure out what's driving things, which is really valuable. I think we're the office of the CFO is majorly uninvested is, is the how of things get done. And so plugging a little bit of Flowcast here, but you think of Flowcast, it tells you not just what the number is, but how we arrived at it or how it was reconciled, who prepared it, who signed off on it, and when that was actually ready, when that number was actually ready to use. <laughs> and now yep. all the rest of the teams can go, whether that's your FP&A team or your SEC reporting team, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, that... I do believe that um, how and automation of how and workflows and how things are done touches really everything, right? You think about mm-hmm. not just your closed process, you think about you know your your commissions and payroll and how they touch things with HR or with sales or with sales ops and and many more processes along those lines. Um, it, it makes sense that that's not a finance only exercise; that is a company wide exercise. Yeah, I think, you know, the way I kind of look at it, and I think any, um, any, any kind of like podcast is, is not done until you get a sports reference. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw one in here, but it's like, it's really not about the touchdown, right? When you think about football, it's not about the touchdown. There were so many things that had to be executed perfectly to get one touchdown in one game. And it's about how, how do you do that? How do you execute that well so that you get more touchdowns so that everything else goes better in the game, right? So it's, and, and that, that how, I really like how you frame that with a, a what, why, and a how, but that how is the lion's share of, of work and burden so that the other two operate at their best peak, right? Like the, the, the what is that touchdown? It's like, well, it really mattered. Did you practice well? Did you execute well? Did people know their routes? Did people know the timing and everything? And if all that's there, you will get the what that you want, but you will not get the what just by saying, well, we'll get a touchdown today. It's like, no, we we needed a whole, like this huge amount of work before that optimized so that we can get to those results. So um, that's my crappy sports plug. Uh, Mike, I've, I've, I've even, no, I've, I've heard some, <laughs> I've heard some say that, you know, operations is a playbook for how to run your company before. And that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was a pretty uh, dynamic founder of a company yeah. called Flowcast. Yeah. Um, what was his name? <laughs> Not to quote myself or anything Mike. here, but yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. But no, I, I agree with that. And I, I also say like, I think, I think the way the role is going to evolve is, is really human nature driven. So like, the way humans work is at least at, at the, you know, like employee level is I, I delegate work that I don't want to do anymore. And then that's, and that just continues down the chain. Right. So like every CEO's goal, I think is to just be as strategic as possible and make high level decisions. And then like 
put the responsibility of making that happen down onto others and have that go. Most of that at this point, I think, has been given to the CFO. So like, I don't know how much more can be given to the CFO. <laughs> it's really a matter of like, what is the CFO going to delegate down to other groups? And it's the how, the why, and the what. My general take is to a CFO, the most interesting stuff is going to be the why. And so you're probably going to focus on the why the business is operating this way, the what you want to achieve. I think the how is the meat and potatoes that CFOs aren't going to be like super excited to run. And so that's going to get delegated down. And in my opinion, the best person to delegate that to is the controller because they hit deadlines, make shit happen. They know how the company runs already. And so that's where I think this is going to play out is like that operational responsibility is going to get delegated. It's going to get delegated to the power user of Flowcast, which is the controller. And they're in a position to help run the whole company just because they're good at hitting deadlines. That's a big part of it. Yeah. It's part of their DNA. And is that it's like is that how it's played out with with you, Razak, and, and Greg, our controller? Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, we talked about my interview process. A good good part of it was talking about how we had a great accounting team in place and, and good controller. I think most, uh, if you ask any new CFO, their first priority is it's normally getting a, a good controllership in place. And I think that speaks to to what Mike's saying because once you once you have the right the right structure in place and the right people in place with the right processes, then you can start expanding on that and you can start giving them more and more operational pieces. But if mm -hmm. that um but you know if your close process is a mess and it takes you 30 days to close each month, then there's no time to do those operational things. So um yeah, I completely agree with what, what Mike was saying. <clears throat> and is that in, in like, you know, and so it seems like by nature it's like, you know, you just know that when it comes to a how question within the process. It's like, all right, get my controller involved, get his team involved. They'll come in and they'll kind of be like, they'll be, they'll be the SEAL team six that's going to come in and fix the solution, right? All of a yeah. sudden you're, you're walking through a, pro a problem. You know, we do walkthroughs, we do narratives, you're understanding these processes, you're writing stuff down. It like applies perfectly to our background of what we do. Yeah. But they're also the ones that, that will notice things before everybody else. They're actually reading all of the custom sales orders and every other exception in the company goes through them. And so they're often going to see first where we're starting to trend to do something different than we have in the past, or they're kind of the tip of the spear on a lot of those things. So it makes sense to solve solve things there before you're, you're nine months into a problem. You, you, they can catch it in the first month. <clears throat> Yeah. And I, and I think it's, you kind of framed it in that way where it's, they're close enough to really the transaction that they can help with it, but they're, they're high up enough that they can still understand the communication of the strategy that you're giving to them. Right. It's kind of that sweet spot. And that's, that's really what makes a good controllers is, are they in the sweet spot that they understand the transaction, but they're not um, so low that they're no longer understanding that high level strategy. to that point that Mike was making where, you know, a controller doesn't want to give a million dollar commission because they're like, no, 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 this is just too much money to give somebody. But if they understand the strategic initiative of the CFO, they're like, no, we want to support people making these type of deals because that's what's driving market cap. Can I quote Mike as well here? The, they speak the language of the business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I will say I'll, I'll throw out like I've had my own journey with all of this. Like when I went to Cornerstone, my first job was to audit all of our contracts and restate them. And as a senior accountant, I got so annoyed that every contract was a little bit different. And I was like, why couldn't they just standardize this? Like, what's so hard about it? And then we start Flowcast and I'm like, oh, now I get it. You're just trying to get some clients. And if someone needs a sentence revised or redlined out, like whatever, we got to get this deal closed and accounting can deal with it later. That was literally like, it. Ha and I was like, now I get it. And they should have done it that way. The priority is getting new clients, not ensuring scalability of contracting processes when you only have six logos. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, yeah. it, I, I've had my own learning along the way. And it's like very, it's very true. The, the, the business, like building a business is necessary to even have an accounting department. <laughs> and, and that's, that's first and foremost, let's get some revenue and, uh, and build the company. I love that. Mike, do you have any last thoughts on where you see, you know, the office of the CFO heading? So really, um, Really, this is you telling Razak what his like next two years, so five yeah. years is going to look like. So I, just be careful with what you say. <laughs> yeah, I would say look, Get my look, notepad out. Look, look at what I do. <laughs> look at what I do on a day to day basis, and what are what do what do I enjoy the least? That's probably the next thing that's going to get delegated, and that's a good. 
idea of the, of the career path. <laughs> You've already taken, you know, you're taking over investor relations. I think that's going to be a bigger, bigger part of this. That's something where we're to scale where there are so many of them. I can't handle all those calls and you do a great job taking that work off my plate. Then there's going to be the bankers as we're getting ready to go public. You know, you're going to handle a lot of that. I'll come in for the dog and pony show where I do my arm waving and try to get people excited about it, that, that whole thing. But yeah, in terms of running it and getting it on track and maintaining that, like, we're going to be handing that off to you as we scale. For, for people who haven't My seen it, it's a really good show. I've seen it. I've seen that show 20 times and I'm excited every time I see it. So it is a really good show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm here for. <laughs> I love it. Well, with that, I'd really like to thank you, Razak, for joining us today. Um, just really, really great insight that you gave into the growth of the office over the last 20 years and, and kind of where you think it's going and then, and, and really some, some, um, good information on, on what's happening today and like what people should expect and hope for from their office, the CFO, from their CFO, from the broader accounting and finance team. And that's wonderful. And and Mike, I think Razak is really thankful for all that work you're going to give him. He seems so thrilled about it. And so I don't think there's going to be any stress or like resistance from him in the future on that stuff. Nope, <laughs> definitely not. And uh, Stefan, I did want to thank you for taking over the hosting here since I couldn't even get through my own last name. I appreciate you uh, running a great interview. Well done. <laughs> No, thank you. No, no problem. Thank you for hosting. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great rest of your day.